We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Nick Barishev, President and CEO of BMG Group. How are you today, Nick? Great. Thanks for having me back. It's excellent to speak with you again and to, you know, I'm looking forward to kind of get your perspective here. So you wrote an article at the tail end of 2021 called The Perfect Storm for Gold. So considering how much has changed even geopolitically since then, has this just added to your bullishness for the yellow metal? Well, yeah, it's kind of like we're in the middle of the storm now. Uh, Before I wrote the article, you could see the storm coming. Now we're here. And, and, you know, when when we look at the the issue in the Ukraine, which is what's on everybody's mind, it's the economic effects of it. Because so the U.S. sanctions Russia, and I don't know, who the strategists were that thought of that, but but <laughs> you don't po- poke a bully that's a lot bigger than you and, and has more clout than you. So then Russia imposes sanction, like on Friday, uh, they, they announced that from here on in, uh, Russian oil and gas has to be in rubles or gold. Mm-hmm. And, and they added that that includes all Russian commodities. And, and they had no choice because the sanctions cut them off swift. So there was no point them selling uh, Russian oil and gas for dollars or euros because they, they, they were useless to them. So um, this was a, an obvious retaliation. And, and the problem becomes, you know, we had inflation already running at highest pace in 40 years, but now that's going to even get bigger because inflation is largely tied to the price of oil. Mm -hmm. As it goes up, everything goes up. And and particularly in Europe and especially Germany, um, this uh, Russia cuts them off. Um, They're they're in deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. The CEO of BASF, I uh, was talking about that if if they can't get uh, oil and gas, they might have to move to Russia. How's that for having your sanctions backfire? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's uh, a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, the, apart from the oil and gas, the, the food issue is going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. Ukraine was considered the breadbasket of Europe. And, you know, in a war zone, there's not much farming happening there. Russia is the biggest producer of fertilizer. That has stopped. So everybody all over the world that needs fertilizer isn't going to get any. Um, So then come the fall, we're going to have massive food shortages. So what are some of the most important factors that we that we haven't touched on that really created this perfect storm for gold in the first place, Nick? Well, it, and it was building. The, these are kind of factors that came, came up, you know, that piled on top of it. But, but gold uh, was doing well. Like gold always uh, does the best in a stagflation. A lot of people think it's inflation. Uh, but gold performs the best in a stagflation. And that's where we're, we're already there, probably, if not clearly there. We're going to have rising inflation and declining GDP. So that's stagflation. So that's the, the worst of all outcomes. Mm-hmm. We've got the, uh, the stock market, the real estate market, bond market, is, they're all in you know, historic bubbles uh, that that are grossly overvalued and we're way past due to a correction. So if you, if you add a massive um, correction in, in say, the, the stock market, uh, then that aggravates everything worse. Uh, 
the Federal Reserve, meantime, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place to deal with inflation. They have to raise interest rates. They raise interest rates. They, they get a massive recession, if not a depression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, big problem. Absolutely. You know, I've asked several guests on the show, when we think about how gold behaves in different inflationary periods, is there a reasonable argument to say that in some ways gold front ran the inflation that we're seeing now in the run-up that we basically saw from 2018 to 2020? Well, to some extent, but you see, the problem has been uh, that the price of gold and silver are highly manipulated, the paper markets. So that throws everything off in, in terms of what would normally be happening. Uh, so you don't get the, the warning signals. Mm -hmm. And it's a ludicrous uh, set of conditions. Like, for instance, when a central bank leases gold, then on their balance sheet, it still shows up as if they have the gold, when in fact they've got an IOU from a bullion bank. There's a big difference between an IOU and gold. Mm -hmm. But they, they treat it as if the gold is still there. The problem that's going to come out is that, that the Russian and Chinese central banks uh, purport to have so much gold, which is relatively small amounts, but they have a, uh, the, the estimates are they have a lot more gold in the sovereign wealth funds. Mm -hmm. And the sovereign wealth funds don't report anything to anybody. But if the sovereign wealth funds have the gold, the question becomes, where did they get the gold from? Because all the gold has been accounted for. So the only place it can be is leased gold, which isn't counted. So if China who, uh, in the central bank has, I think it's 1,600 tons, mm -hmm. one day announces that they have 5,000, 10,000 tons, and the question, where did they get that gold from? Because we've accounted for it. Mm -hmm. Well, then and you can only trace it back. That means this is leased gold from the Western Central Bank. And the Western Central Banks don't have it. China does. And it ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I've seen estimates that China could be as high as uh, 35,000 tons. Mm -hmm. Some of that is privately held and then the rest is is publicly held. But like you say, once that, let's say, announcement is made, that yeah. could be really shocking for the rest of the world. But do you think that would well, be that's part right, Because then, then all, all the analysts are going to say, well, where did they get it from? And they're going to have to conclude that the 8,000 tons that the U.S. purportedly has probably isn't there. Mm -hmm. It's long gone. It hasn't been audited since the 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, the lack of transparency there does make one question whether it is it is actually there or, or who's leasing it, right? That's right. Yeah. If, if it wasn't a problem like Ron Paul has been a leader in auditing the Fed and uh, it's it's been fought tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. why, why would you have to fight it tooth and nail if it's really there? Come on in and audit it, boys. Here it is. Count. Okay. So, so what happens? Nick, do you think that, you know, as part of an announcement, let's say either by Russia or China, that they have a lot more gold than they have reported previously, do you think that that would be, you know, as part of a, a way to say that they're backing either of their currencies with gold? Well, I think that's, that's the agenda. They've both said that they uh, want to move away from the U.S. dollar. Uh, Russia has been forced to move away from it. Mm -hmm. um, China, China is considering it. The thing that's propped up the U.S. dollar all these years has been the, the, the petrol trade. And that was started by Kissinger in the 70s with the Saudi royal family. The deal was that 
the U.S. would protect the Saudi royal family if they agreed to sell all the oil in U.S. dollars. Uh, they agreed to that, then the other OPEC countries came along. So now there seems to be a rift between the U.S. and the Saudis, and the Saudis are in active negotiation with the Chinese to sell Saudi oil in one. So if, if that is ever done, the uh, U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency is over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we when we look at, let's say, how long these reserve currencies normally, let's say, stay in power for or are, are used as the reserve currency, we are getting towards the end of a, a well, time period actually, that is fairly typical. We're actually right? past, past that point already. So, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so that's 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 the issue. And when you look at the the amount of debt, you know, to, to be a reserve currency, uh, your your debt situation needs to be kept under control. But when it goes out of control, uh, the U.S. has piled on more debt in the last couple of years than they did in World War II. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also recently saw that the Russian central bank will restart buying gold from banks and will pay a fixed price of 5,000 rubles per gram between March 28th and June 30th. So has this effectively put a floor under the price of gold? Yeah, it basically translates into a floor of about 1940 per ounce in U.S. dollars. Um, so if, if this keeps going... Uh, like the the ruble has uh, recovered its its initial losses, it's total, totally up there, and um, uh, as as they uh, acquire more and more gold, uh, the the ruble will strengthen. Uh, Russia has a very low debt to GDP. Uh, America is way over the top. Uh, they, they have a reasonable tax rate. I think it's a fixed tax rate of 15% across the board. And, and they've dropped their uh, sales tax on gold from, uh, by, you know, US or Russian citizens buying it, no longer have to pay tax. So just like China did, they're encouraging their citizens to accumulate gold. So you you wrote a book entitled Ten Thousand Dollar Gold in 2013. So is this still a reasonable target for gold in your mind, or do you think it's going higher than that? Well, we're the, based on the original calculation. We now get fourteen thousand, and and the way I did that was that what used to be the norm would be to have five percent of all portfolios holding gold. So today it's not 5%, it's 0.5%. So if that allocation was to move to 5%, you'd have something like $20 trillion moving to gold. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't increase mine supply, the only adjusting factor is the price. So if you try and push $20 trillion into gold, Price has to go to fourteen thousand an ounce, mm -hmm. and if things get uh, really haywire, then people will be scrambling, and and they're going to want to hold a lot more than five percent. My view is that right now, investors should hold a minimum of twenty percent, given the current conditions. Mm -hmm. You know that that exercise. Every time we think of gold in, in dollar terms, it seems somewhat confusing as well, because that is, you know, in, in some ways, two, two moving assets relative to each other. So is part of that 14000 mm -hmm. the devaluation of the dollar as well? Well, with gold, I, I think you have to compare. Gold is ultimate money together with silver. Everything else is a credit instrument. But if you compare the performance of gold in all the world's currency, the, the average appreciation since 2000 
is about 11% a year. Now, the amazing thing is, you know, people keep saying, well, when, when is the gold price going to go up? When is this? And tired waiting for all this long. Well, you're getting 10%. What's, what's your problem? Mm -hmm. Like pension funds typically target for returns of 6% and don't get that. So if you're sitting by waiting for things to happen and you're getting 10%, not that bad. Yeah, absolutely. To kind of have a risk-free or quote unquote risk-free asset, I guess nothing is never ever completely risk-free, but to have a relatively risk-free asset compounding like that is. See, what, what people miss is that there's going to be a, a market correction anytime soon. And the, the, the mainstream thinking is to always stay invested. Now that's okay in a bull market. It's a bad idea during when you're sitting on the precipice of a collapse. Like when when 19 when we had the, the collapse in 1929, it took 27 years to break even mm -hmm. without considering inflation. And in the dot-com crash in in 2000. It's taken 15 years to break even. The Japanese Nikkei, which crashed in 89, was one of the best stock markets in the world, still hasn't broken even. So if you stay invested and, and you're a baby boomer, you're not going to live long enough to break even this time around. Mm -hmm. And you'll miss one of the biggest opportunities because if you're in cash or gold, the market tanks, you can then reinvest at 50 to 70% discount. Mm -hmm. If you're invested, you're going to be waiting a long time to break even. Mm -hmm. Nick, when you talk about the, let's say the, the Nikkei, for example, not still not breaking even, is that is that inflation adjusted as well? No, that's not inflation adjusted. It's even longer if you bring in inflation. So now, that's what people have lost sight of. And, you know, I'm of the old school because it used to be that if market conditions got dicey, you, you would take your money off the table and wait it out and then reinvest. Mm -hmm. You don't sit there and get slaughtered. The, the example I use is uh, because my background's in real estate, so there's a, a REIT in Canada called the Dundee Dream Office REIT, mm -hmm. which has $12 billion worth of AAA office buildings all across Canada. So in 2008, that REIT declined 84%. At the bottom, the dividend yield was 30. Reason for that, is while the price of the REIT went down, the rental income didn't change at all. Okay, so you, you get these anomalies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason it, it declined by 84% is because uh, relative to the overall markets, it's relatively thinly traded. Mm -hmm. This is what happens with mining stocks. When the broad equity markets go down, Mining stocks take a bigger hit, even if the price of gold is going up mm -hmm. because they're so thinly traded. But that's where the opportunity lies. You wait to, to the correction ends and then buy your favorite stocks at you know 30 to 50 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. So Nick, in that you know, market collapse as, as you're talking about. Do you think gold and silver take quite a hit at that point as well? Oftentimes, if there's a percent, like if we were to have a, a one day precipitous decline uh, of, let's say, more than 20%, then gold would initially take a hit as well. But everything would, but it would be the first to recover in the next few days. As the dust settles, it would go up. Mm -hmm. So, and, and would correct very quickly. Mm -hmm. 
before we hit record here today, Nick, we were kind of talking about the freezing of bank accounts in Canada during the Emergency Measures Act. So what are some of the, the unintended consequences or the downstream effects of that? And kind of what are your thoughts around how that entire situation has played out? Well, for, first of all, it, it was a huge government overreach because to declare a, a, an Emergency Measures Act, you have to meet specific criteria which weren't met. And it needs to be essentially like civil insurrection, blood in the streets kind of thing. Um, this was nothing. It was a peaceful protest. Um, there was no violence, no insurrection. Uh, nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed, etc. Mm -hmm. So it was totally un unnecessary. Um, the existing police forces could have dealt with it if they wanted to remove it. You didn't have to do that. And then, but to take that and and freeze people's bank accounts that contributed to the to the uh, truckers uh, and so on. That's what's really rattled people. That if if they can do that at the drop of a hat, what else can they do? And that's where many people realize that when you have money in the bank, it's not being held in trust for you. It's actually a loan to the bank. Mm -hmm. And they can do all kinds of things with the money because it's their money, not yours. And that's where a big difference comes in when you're when you're uh, storing bullion with a custodial custodian. Uh, it's being held in trust for you. So it's a vast difference. Now it doesn't mean the government can, you know, put in punitive measures to for people that own bullion, but so far we haven't gone there. Mm -hmm. So considering, you know, we're we're facing record inflation, we also saw a, a carbon tax in, increase on April 1st in, in Canada. So how destructive have the, the Trudeau policies been on Canadians? Well, all of this, you know, whether it's Biden's policies or Trudeau's policy, it's like, you know, you have to shake your head. Um, if you go back to Biden's first day in office, if, if he hadn't screwed up the entire energy business in the United States, Putin wouldn't have attacked Ukraine mm -hmm. because he wouldn't have made the money. But by doing that, the, the world became dependent on Russian energy and oil, Putin made a ton of money and that then he could invade Ukraine. So, and, and the, the amazing thing is after the fact that Biden doesn't admit that was a mistake and correct it now when it's obvious to everyone. Mm -hmm. So Nick, we've heard lots of talk about the, the great reset. So how do you see it progressing at this point? Well, it's, it's been progressing because, for example, uh, Trudeau is one of the young leaders of the WEF. Uh, Christine Freeland is a director of the WEF. And Klaus Schwab brags about the fact that uh, most of the cabinet are members. So it's concerning when they have that kind of control mm -hmm. and and when you consider are they getting their marching orders from from Klaus or from the uh, the electorate and it seems to be that that it's from Klaus in in major Western countries in the US and so on nothing else makes sense mm -hmm. uh, the, the the concerns there is that uh, their agenda is to reduce the population by several billion people uh, and to cause a crash where everybody loses everything. And, you know, you'll be happy when you own nothing and so on. So it's, it's not a particularly uh, uplifting look, but again, that's not covered in the mainstream and the mainstream public. Mm -hmm. really isn't aware. They don't know what the WEF is. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you think could tremendously, let's say, destabilize the, the viability of this plan? Well, um, there, there are so, so many things. Like one of, one of the issues is, is that it might be that China and Russia are colluding, that they don't want that kind of global tyranny in, in place, and that, and that could break it. Uh, a change of the reserve currency and what gold is, all these kind of things can you know, destabilize it. Um, but right, right now, like we've got uh, rising inflation and it, it's largely due to uh, supply inflation. Like for instance, the unintended consequences of the war in Ukraine is there was a factory that made wiring harnesses for uh, Mercedes and BMW. Now, the thing is the wiring harnesses when the car is on the assembly line, have to be put in first. You can't build the car and later put the wire harnesses. So that company is no longer there. Uh, so Mercedes and, and BMW have had to shut down the plants because they can't get wiring harnesses. So these kind of compounding effects are gonna get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Everybody was aware of the chip shortage, uh, but now it's going to become more and more prolific in many other areas. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that's, you know, one of the factors, this, this real supply chain crunch that we saw, you know, starting with COVID and then really being exacerbated with the Russia Ukraine situation here, sanctions. I mean, there's a million different ways to look at it. Is that part of part of what makes this inflationary environment so much different than any other period that we've seen? Well, that's right because it's it's a, a supply push kind of inflation rather than demand or and so on because the uh, the the manufacturers are having to you know, pass on the, on the pricing and all over the place, people are having difficulty getting parts to make parts or shortages and it just goes on and on. So that's kind of the ripple effects of all that. And in some ways, if we look at it from the other side as well, we don't, have, you know, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada, they don't really have the ability to, to really get aggressive with interest rates to be able to quote unquote fight that inflation either right no it's not like 1980 when volcker raised interest rates to 18 percent like the long term mean and in interest rates is five and if they uh, raised rates to five then the, it would destroy the real estate market the the stock market and there'd be a major recession if not a depression that's only to five. And you'd have enormous uh, budget deficits, which are big enough as is, but with 5% interest rate on the federal debt, it, it would be that, that many times worse. Mm -hmm. So they, they can't even go there. They can raise interest rates by a quarter of a point and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when when we kind of touched on earlier, the lack of fertilizer, for example, and right. the lack of farming that's coming out of Ukraine this year, is that really going to have a, a very dramatic effect on food prices this year, more than we've already seen? Uh, well, it depends on the country you're in. Like in Canada, it, it'll have less of an effect. But if you look at uh, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, like the Europeans are already talking about uh, rationing for gasoline and food, you know, and, and I'm just starting. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where the outcome is. And the problem is going to be not, not as much as, you know, affording the prices of gasoline and food, but having it available, period. Mm -hmm. and, and it's for different reasons. Um, like just as a personal note, I, I was in, 
I feed my dogs raw meat. I was into the supplier for raw meat and they had no turkey. I said, why don't you have any turkey? Well, the abattoir where they get the turkeys in Ontario is closed down because they couldn't get the workers because the workers were making more on government subsidies than going and having a shitty job at an abattoir. Mm -hmm. But it shuts down and now there is no turkey meat. Mm -hmm. So these are being caused by, by other effects like the, this is, uh, these effects are coming out of the, the, the failed COVID policies. Again, more more unintended consequences that we've seen so much here in the past right. uh, two years, really. So right. do you think gold and silver are going to make up for lost time? And should investors be seriously thinking about diversifying their portfolios? And, and how should they go about thinking about that? Well, if I, like as a beginning point, uh, my view is in, in today, if you're going to maintain the rest of your portfolio, you'd need at least 20%. Uh, and then it depends on, like we have two product lines. We have mutual funds, which are primarily targeted for uh, registered accounts like RRSPs, TFSAs, RESPs. And then we have physical bullion. So uh, that's largely for high net worth investors and institutions where they buy the bullion and they can either take delivery of it or put it in storage with prints. So depending on what your allocation is, the thing is that you need to start and accumulate your positions. Nobody's uh, that smart to pick the right day. So just start by, by buying an, you know, on a sort of dollar cost averaging basis mm -hmm. to build up your uh, portfolio. And, and we recently saw an announcement that there's going to be a, a gold bar database form. So do you think that's going to help with, with fraud? Well, fra fraud hasn't been a big deal in the, in the big bars, like, like the 400 ounce gold bars, that's where, where it's meant. And there's various methods. So uh, when you, when you buy a 400 ounce LBMA bar, you, you can already track the, the chain of custody of that bar. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's number one. There, there has been a few instances where uh, you have a gold-plated tungsten bar because tungsten is you know, just about the same density as gold. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that will look and feel the same. But with electronic equipment, you can tell it's a tungsten bar. Mm -hmm. uh, like it, it'll scan it and tell you 99% tungsten. Uh, so I, I don't see it as the biggest problem. Like if people have been conned in buying 400 ounce bars, I mean, they're, they're almost a million dollars a piece, then uh, something's definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the actual need for it is? Well, I, I don't know. I guess it's it's to be able to track the uh, the bars, but you can already track the bars when you when you buy a bar from a an LBMA member. Mm -hmm. um, and they and they they certify that it's maintained its chain of custody, meaning it has to be stored in. LBMA member vaults and so on. If you take delivery of it and take it home to get it back into the system, you have to have it reassayed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But if you leave it in the system of LBMA vaults, then you don't have to. It's instantly liquid. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much a problem with coins because uh, um, it's in, in silver, it's not worth it to do fake silver coins. But in gold coins, yeah, you can make a, a gold-plated coins. Where, where that scam has come up with is the numismatic coins. 
like for a gold coin that sells for 2,500 bucks, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if it's a numismatic collector's coin for a hundred grand, then that's, that's where you've got to watch the, the fakes because you could have a, a, a pure gold coin that's supposed to be a collector's coin, but is a fake, mm -hmm. but it's pure gold. But, you know, just as, uh, and, but it can be a difference between 2,000 and 100,000. Excellent, Nick. Well, I think that's a, a good place to kind of wrap up today's conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we do? Uh, no, that's it. Uh, we've, we've got two sites now, the BMG Group site, which is for our products. And we also have a BMG DIY investor site which has a lot of inv investing information for do-it-yourself investors. Excellent. And of course, you're also available on Twitter at BMG Group Inc. Right. Nick, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.